camera. Today's October 23rd, 2017. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center. And with me is Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Tom Guy, Tom Gay, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Gay is a veteran of the Vietnam War. Uh, he served in the Marines and has had a distinguished business career subsequent to his leaving the military. Uh, this is part of the, Viet the Vietnam History Project out of Washington. Uh, the Library of Congress has set up this program to try to save the stories of our veterans. And without Mr. Gay's participation and the other veterans' participation, we would not have a, a summary of the stories that these gentlemen and ladies have been through. And we really appreciate you coming in today and uh, telling your story. I'm glad to be here. Would you give us your full name and the city and state where you live? My name is Logan Thomas Gay, Jr. Most people call me Tom, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Cuthbert, Georgia. That's in Randolph County. That's in southwest Georgia, about midway between Columbus and Albany, on August 12, 1944. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, once again, born in Cuthbert, Georgia. That uh, is where my father's uh, parents lived. And uh, my father at that time was uh, in the Army uh, in World War II in Europe. And my mother and my older sister, uh, and when I was born, me, uh, uh, lived there with uh, my grandparents until my father returned from the war. Uh, uh, when he returned, and of course I was too young to know the exact timing of all this, but when he returned, we... Uh, uh, moved to Atlanta. He had been a student at Georgia Tech and my mother had been at Agnes Scott and then the war disrupted all that and they got married and uh, started having children. Um, but after the war with a wife and two children he needed to work and so uh, came to Atlanta. Uh, he had been uh, majoring in architecture at Georgia Tech and so he got a construction job with uh, the Ira H. Harden Construction Company and uh, was a superintendent for a few years. And then he got an opportunity to uh, 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 form his own little company. Uh, uh, he borrowed some money and got a, got a project opportunity. And uh, so he was sort of off on, it, on, on his own then in his company. So uh, I grew up in Atlanta. Uh, went to, to Mrs. Miriam High School's kindergarten, which was in the basement of her house. Uh, then, and uh, then went a couple of years to Marsh Brandon Elementary School here in Atlanta. And uh, then my parents moved around a little bit, and there was a divorce. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, I, from the fourth grade through the eighth grade, I went to what was then Georgia Military Academy uh, and, and lived on campus. Uh, so uh, lived that that sort of military routine of making our bunks and standing inspections and polishing brass and shining shoes for five years, but really got what I think uh, was a good education, good good foundational education at that point. But it but it sort of helped set the tone for uh, my uh, appreciation for the military and that 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 style of life. Of course, uh, during that period of time, the late 40s and uh, the early 50s, uh, we were still, uh, as a nation, very much awash in the, the military actions and, and all the guys from World War II and all of their stories and, and then Korea in the midst of all that. So it was sort of a, sort of a time when, when kids like me uh, really saw a lot of guys in uniform and admired all that and uh, uh, expected one day we would we would also be in uniform, uh, but um, anyway, uh, eventually uh, uh, was at Northside High School here in Atlanta, and graduated there. Uh, the way I stumbled into uh, my military uh, uh, service was at Northside High School. I was a 
uh, a senior there, and I was just walking down the hall between classes one day with some of my buddies, and the uh, counselor at Northside in those days was Mr. Kemp, and Mr. Kemp happened to walk out of his office about the time we walked by, and uh, he he hollered to us, "You you guys come in here for a minute." So. Uh, we walk, walked into his office, not not sure if we were in trouble or not, but he said, uh, uh, "I have I have a quota to fill. I have to send uh, a few guys over to uh, the Naval Air Station uh, in a week or two to to uh, take the uh, entry test for the Navy ROTC scholarship program." And uh, uh, you guys look like you'd be good candidates, and uh, why don't y'all go take it? And so. Uh, I went home that night and uh, talked to my dad, and of course he thought it was a great idea. So anything that had the, the word scholarship on it sounded good to him. <laughs> so uh, uh, he said, "Oh, that'd be great, you know." And uh, boy, the Navy's terrific, you know. And if you got a scholarship, that'd be great. He didn't know much about it, but it just sounded good. So I, I went out with my buddies, and uh, it was a two-part thing. The first test was like a like an SAT test. It was an academic test, and it was a lot harder than I expected. But uh, a few weeks later, I uh, learned that I passed that test. And then the second uh, phase was to go get a, a physical. And uh, I did that and, and passed the physical. And so then I filled out more paperwork and applications. And uh, later uh, learned that I had been uh, accepted if I wanted to uh, take the scholarship. And uh, I don't know how the program is structured now, but, but you could look at the various colleges and universities that have Navy ROTC, and you had to independently apply to those schools, and then if you got into the school, then you get the scholarship. Anyway, long story short, uh, uh, my, since my dad had gone to Georgia Tech and I went to all those football games growing up, uh, I, that was really where I wanted to go. And, and uh, so I was accepted at Georgia Tech, and the Navy said, that's fine. And so uh, I went to Georgia Tech on a Navy ROTC scholarship. There were two types. There was one uh, uh, that led to a reserve commission, which at that time uh, uh, required three years of service with a reserve commission. And then there, the other type was a regular scholarship that led to a regular commission that would hope that you would be just a career officer, have a regular commission. And I got the regular scholarship. And so uh, attended Georgia Tech on that scholarship. And, it, uh, you know, I don't know how most people are, but, but you know, at, at age 18, I mean, I could hardly see beyond the end of my arm. You know, I'd, my horizons were short at that point. Uh, but uh, uh, the Navy ROTC program was a, was a fairly rigorous program. I mean, it, it was not just a casual thing that where you put on a uniform once a week and went to drill. We had we had classes, academic classes uh, to take in, in naval history and weaponry and all these other things and uh, in addition to my normal uh, course load. Uh, but I, I had a real active life uh, socially, academically, and, and in the Navy ROTC at Georgia Tech. It was a great experience for me. Uh, every summer uh, between academic years uh, we would take a, a military cruise they called it and between my freshman and sophomore year I got orders to uh, uh, report to Newport Rhode Island and I spent the summer on a de Navy destroyer uh, quite an experience and uh, then uh, uh, the second summer between sophomore and junior uh, I uh, Spent half of that time at Little Creek, Virginia for uh, amphibious warfare training with the Marines. And then the second half of that period went to Corpus Christi, Texas for a little flight indoctrination and flying around in some of the Navy trainer planes and so forth. It, enjoyed it. It was great, great yeah. experience, you know. Uh, so after your sophomore year, you choose whether you want to go into the Navy leading to a, a, a commission as uh, Navy officer, or do you want to go in the Marines? And you apply for that. And uh, after some pretty careful thought, I decided I wanted to be in the Marine Corps. Just something appealed to me about that. Uh, I was 
you know, physically worked out a lot and active and uh, just liked the like the reputation of the Marine Corps and wanted to wanted to sign up with them. So I did. Uh, my dad was a little disappointed. He thought he, he'd rather see me on a ship, you know, sailing around. But uh, anyway, uh, I went and I took Marine option. So I did that. Uh, uh, I was proud that my senior year in the Navy ROTC program, I was the battalion commander of our Navy ROTC wow. unit. And, and that was a real honor and, and I enjoyed it. And uh, uh, then uh, after graduation from Georgia Tech in uh, the spring of 1966, um, I reported to Quantico, Virginia, had a little brief uh, uh, officer boot camp sort of experience for six or eight weeks, and then received my commission uh, in September of 1966. At that point, uh, you know, Vietnam was ramping up, you know, number of troops we were sending. In your mind, did you feel like you had a pretty good chance of going or was that even something you talked about much with your cohorts? Or? Well, uh, at that point, I was 100% certain I was going. Okay. Uh, uh, all the Marines were going. Uh, the Marine uh, instructors we had at Quantico, had returned, they had served, and and so they were fresh off the battlefield, so to speak, and were full of stories and and um, uh, trying to motivate us to, to get serious about this and get ready. And and so uh, my entire uh, experience at Quantico, uh, well, in September I started the officer basic course, which ran from September of 66 through early January of 67. But uh, that entire course was uh, to train us and prepare us and indoctrinate us and physically and, and with military skills as well uh, for that. Uh, you, you may know that uh, uh, in those days at least, and I think maybe still, uh, all Marines were considered first uh, uh, an infantry officer and, and a rifleman. So if, if you were going to be in the supply corps or aviation or any other field, uh, you still had to go through the, the basic course, which was basic infantry training. So um, uh, I did that. And toward the end of your course, uh, you got to ask for which branch or what specialty you wanted. And I wanted uh, the infantry. Yeah, I think you put three choices maybe, and I wanted the infantry, and then the next was, was artillery, and I forgot what my third choice was. And I remember my, my uh, company commander calling me in and uh, uh, saying, you know, we've got all these applications and we're looking at yours now, and, and uh, uh, you're in the top 25% of your class and you've done real well and uh, ordinarily we'd give you your first choice, but I just need to tell you that with your Georgia Tech degree and with uh, the training that the artillery officers have to go through, there's a good bit of math and, and understanding of weaponry and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of our liberal arts guys don't do that well in that course, and so I'm, I'm going to assign you to field artillery. So, a little bit disappointed, but yeah. anyway, that, that's, that's the way it played out. In the end, it was fine. So uh, uh, the Marines don't have their own uh, artillery school. And so we went uh, to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to the Army Artillery School. And uh, I went there in, uh, I guess it was early February of 67, uh, and stayed until uh, either late March or early April of 67 and uh, it was it was a it was a good course here again a lot of it was more academic than I expected you know but it was good and it and it gave me good good training and preparation and of course all second lieutenants or just about all second lieutenants start out as forward observers and so you know reading maps and and calling in fire was what we were going to do for a living for quite a while and uh, I, I, se I seemed to uh, do well there at the artillery school with that, that part of it. So 
Uh, well, your education probably helped. As, as I, the I think so. And, and then I and then I've learned through the years, and and I don't know, I may be wrong, really, but I think some people are sort of spatially a little better oriented than other people, and I tend to have that. I benefit from, right. you know, I, I, I can find my way around. I, I'm spatially oriented pretty well. So map reading and land navigation came uh, fairly easy for me, you know. Uh, of course, I learned later in Vietnam that uh, if you don't have any landmarks, <laughs> it's not quite <laughs> as easy cool. as it is in the States, you know, <laughs> when you have highways and freeways and buildings. Uh, but um, so... Uh, I've forgotten exactly when I got my orders. I, I mean, I knew I was going to Vietnam, and I think, I think I got my orders to Vietnam at the end of my basic school at Quantico, and they said, you know, first go to artillery school, and, and then you're going to Vietnam. I mean, we all knew we were going, and we all went. Yeah. Uh, but I don't remember exactly when I learned that I was going to go to the uh, 1st Marine Division. But anyway, that, that's yeah. where I, that's, my orders came, and, yeah. and, uh, and I left home, left the States uh, in uh, mid-April uh, after a week or two leave and, and uh, flew to San Francisco, spent my last night on terra firma uh, in San Francisco with some buddies and uh, departed and went to... Uh, I think we went to Okinawa for a, a, a few days of, of just getting uh, acclimated yeah. to a warmer climate and and maybe getting some more shots or something. I've forgotten now. Uh, and, and so uh, then in late April, uh, we took a charter flight. And that was always kind of interesting to me that it was – Flying Tiger Airlines or something like that, uh, that we all climbed aboard. And, um, and um, they had flight attendants, you know, nice ladies who were flight attendants and civilian guys. But uh, they, they dropped us right into Da Nang, you know, landed right there in Da Nang. And, and uh, uh, so we were talking a little earlier about first impressions. Uh, and when, uh, when we landed, uh, and they opened the door and they rolled up the, the ramp of the steps to descend off from. Uh, it was absolutely like an oven. I mean, it was just, you know, from a somewhat air-conditioned cabin of a plane to an to a absolute oven. Uh, and so we went down the steps and they directed us over to a, a hangar while they unloaded our sea bags so we could claim those. And when we walked into the hangar, there all around the hangar were wounded guys, all bandaged up and on laying on stretchers and some were moaning and some were looking at us and I mean it was just an emotional yeah. sort of, you know, wow. shock that uh oh my gosh, you know <laughs> Here we are. This is actually Vietnam. And you realized you know. what you were doing. Yeah, around, right? yeah. Uh, uh, but I'll never forget that first that first impression, yeah. you know, of those guys and feeling sorry for them. Yeah. And they were waiting on their flight out. Uh, but uh, anyway, we didn't really interact with them. Uh, we just sort of stood there in silence and uh, got our gear. And um, so... Uh, somebody was there to help us, and they looked at our orders, each, each, of, our, each of us, and they said, okay, uh, you're First Marine Division, you go in this direction, you go that direction. And so I um, uh, got to the division building there, and uh, they said, okay, you're artillery, so you go to the 11th uh, Marine Regiment. That's the regiment that, artillery regiment that supports First Marine the Division. And uh, got to... 11th Marines, and I think spent the night, they had some temporary, a couple of temporary little wood buildings there, and spent by that time we spent the night uh, there. And the next morning, uh, lined us up again, and uh, they said, okay, you're going to go 
to the uh, Delta Battery 2nd Battalion, 11th Marine. Uh, and uh, that battery is in direct support of the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine, that's an infantry uh, battalion. And uh, I said, okay, uh, where, where is that? And they said, well, we're not exactly sure, but they're out in the field and uh, the, the best thing to do is to uh, go out and, and catch a hop down to Chulai, which is south of Da Nang. There was an airfield there. And when you get to Chulai, uh, just ask and, and they'll, know, they'll know where it is. So, you know, <laughs> being one to follow orders, I did. And I, I, I took a flight and I got down to Chulai and here again, hot as a Dickens. And, uh, and uh, uh, started asking around, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to report to Delta Battery uh, 211. And they're there with first Battalion, fifth Marines. Golly, those guys are on the move. Uh, I'm I'm not exactly sure. I think they're I think they're just north of here, uh, at, at Tam Key, but I, we're not too sure. Anyway, there was a lot of doubt about exactly where they were. And of course, July was was had a perimeter, and then once you left that, you're out in Vietnam, at, you know, yeah. <laughs> unprotected territory. Yeah. But uh, somebody said go out to the to the front gate there at, at highway one and ask the security guys they know where these all these trucks are going and coming and uh, so the guy said yeah they're they're up they're up that way and and just just thumb a ride with with one of these trucks going and they anyway it was sort of that stumbling <laughs> stumbling uh indoctrination uh but it all worked out and uh one thing that i was a little bit uncomfortable was is i had to leave the chulai base and, and you didn't draw your weapon until you got to your unit. So, you know, I didn't have a weapon. Of course, there were a lot of, there was a lot of activity there, but still, no weapon. Carrying my sea bag, you know, still had polish on my boots. And, you know, I, I, I was definitely green. Uh, but, uh, but did get to, to Tam Key, and I've forgotten how many miles it is, but it's a, it's, it's a number of miles up the road there. Talk about your impressions of what you saw as, as you were riding up to Tam Key. Well, lots of civilian activity, lots of lots of people, lots of the little uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, motor vehicles, uh, a lot of motorcycles, and and uh, uh, the little small carts that carry stuff and uh, a certain amount of livestock. And then, you know, I mean, we we're very much out in the population as we went up went up the road, but there was no, that nobody seemed to be concerned about any, any threats, yeah. you know, yeah. at that point. Uh, but it was, uh, it was just uh, interesting, uh, you know, really, really being in the country now and, and seeing uh, the civilian activity and they didn't seem to be paying too much attention to these military trucks. I guess mm -hmm. there's a stream of those up and down that road every day. Just to get a time perspective, what month was this? This is April of 1967. Okay. okay. And as it turns out, uh, April of 1967 uh, is when the Marines decided to take control of the Quezon Valley. And I've reacquainted myself recently with some of that, some of that history, but uh, the Quezon Valley is, is, a, is a wide valley and it, and it runs generally uh, west to east to the sea uh, from from the mountains, uh, really, really about where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was going north and south down the, the western border of South Vietnam. Uh, it sort of touches that or almost does. And so as it turns out, uh, the North Vietnamese for some time had their eye on that valley as a controlling feature in their overall strategy to uh, to take South Vietnam. It's very close to Da Nang. Da Nang, of course, the second largest city in, in South Vietnam. And uh, so their plan, as we learn, all learn later, but, but anyway, their plan was to take control of the Quezon Valley because of several reasons. One, it would position them well for the Tet Offensive in 1968 to take the city of Da Nang just as they took the city of Hue. Uh, it also, it was a very fertile valley, probably still is, full of uh, a lot of water, river and tributaries and so forth. And they had two 
really good rice crops every year, much more rice than, than the population there consumed. And so there was an abundant supply of rice that the North Vietnamese could garner and, and save for their, their purposes. So in, actually, in late 1965, uh, uh, lead elements of the North Vietnamese started populating the Quezon Valley. They started moving in, finding locations for command posts, finding places to create uh, uh, storage sites for weapons and ammunition and uh, medical supplies, uniforms, etc. And so for over a year, year and a half, they were first supplying the area with, with, with the logistics that the troops would need. And that was, turned out it was a, a pretty clever strategy that they had throughout the war. They would come in first, all, all of it at night or most of it at night, and they would hide their supplies, hide their ammo, hide their extra weapons and so forth before the, uh, the combat, their combat troops would come in. So they did this for quite some time for a major operation. Of course, they, they were planning to move in and did move in the entire 2nd NVA Division. And so in early uh, 1967, they started moving those troops down from, from North Vietnam, the 2nd NVA Division. And they started moving into the mountains and into the jungles that surrounded that valley. Uh, the Allies, we, the Marines got, got wind of all that activity going on. There weren't any real battles going on, but a lot of activity. And so the Marines, they decided uh, to, uh, to stop that and to take control of the Quezon Valley. One interesting thing that I did not know at the time, or even until recently, is that uh, from April of 1967 through November of 1967, which was the time of that, that battle, that intense battle with the Marines versus the 2nd NVA Division, uh, over 900 Marines and Navy corpsmen uh, were killed, and over 6,000 uh, enemy troops were killed. And turns out that that was the most lives lost on any piece of real estate in the entire Vietnam War, including Quezon, Contien, Way City. Uh, and so it's just an interesting, yeah. it, it just reminded me of the intensity of those months that I was a forward observer there. Uh, uh, but uh, so back to my story. So. I arrived in uh, in Tam Key only only to 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 find that uh, our battery was preparing to relocate as we as the Marines uh, moved to occupy the Quezon Valley and stop the infiltration of the Second NVA Division. They moved the First Battalion, Fifth Marines, and my battery, Delta Battery to the west end of the, of the uh, Quezon Valley over near the mountains. So after one or two nights in Tam Key, uh, I was selected to go with the battery commander and the fire direction officer and a lead element of, the, of our artillery pieces. And we were flown in because we couldn't get road access to where we were going. So the, the trucks, the vehicles that normally tow our howitzers were there in Tam Key, but they picked up, I think there were maybe four guns, and, and f flew us over there, and we, we were to, to establish our, our battery there. Uh, and so I was, I was with that, uh, that lead element that went in, and, and, and uh, at least one company from the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines there uh, to help set up the, the perimeter and the security and so forth. Talk about what you specifically did and what your role was, how you did it, some of your experiences when you did it, when you first got to the valley. Well, there was a shortage of Ford observers. I think they were falling out pretty fast or something. But anyway, uh, uh, I was a brand new second lieutenant and I was uh, assigned as a Ford observer for our battery. And Ford observers are assigned out to uh, infantry companies and infantry battalions 
uh, to uh, call in uh, supporting fire artillery fire when needed. So uh, after a short, <coughs> a short number of days of just getting indoctrinated and, and getting the maps and just sort of uh, learning you know, how things were organized and who was who, uh, I, was, I was sent out as a forward observer uh, with, with these infantry units. I, I should say that uh, that that second or third night with my battery uh, that we that I was chosen to go up ahead to this new location in the west end of the Quezon Valley. Uh, we got there. We 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 dug in the guns, and they, there's a term called laying the guns, which means establishing where they are on the map and 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 getting them oriented with the compass and all that sort of stuff uh, so that they'll be in a position to respond to, to requests for fire and so forth. And they brought in ammunition and then one of the key elements of a battery is a fire direction center and that's where the the radio traffic comes in when someone calls in and needs artillery fire where the, all that information is processed and and uh, the the calculations are made and and the commands are given to the guns of which way to turn and what powder to put in the in the rounds and all all the all the information you need to fire so the fire direction center is critical and of course the guns and and getting them ready to fire is critical so we spent all day getting them up and going it was always uh, critical to to minimize the downtime to to get them ready to fire just as soon as possible and so uh, as we worked real hard all day to do that uh, Fire Direction Center was a tent, uh, and we typically would take these artillery ammunition crates, these these wooden crates that artillery rounds came in in those days, and remove the rounds, uh, put them near the guns, and then take those empty crates and fill those with dirt, and stack them and and sort of make a little bunker uh, using those. It was a convenient way to sort of make a, a bunker to give you some protection from, from mortars and, and mm -hmm. rifles and so forth. So we worked real hard all day on, on all that. And late in the afternoon, uh, we started getting sniper fire, which uh, didn't bother anybody too much. Uh, uh, and then the mortars uh, started, and that was, that was a little more disturbing. Uh, and so they walked the mortars on in, and we were trying to return fire, and, there two, and the um, infantry guys had mortars, and it, going back and forth, but anyway, we d didn't knock them out. But uh, the, the memorable part of that, my, my, my first uh, uh, day or evening in this new location that we just moved to, uh, the battery, com so, the mortars get closer and closer, and finally we take cover behind this little three-foot-high stack of, of ammo boxes filled with dirt. And so the battery commander's at, ahead of me there, and then I'm laying at his feet, and then at my feet is the fire direction officer who was a, uh, an older guy uh, who was a lieutenant, but he had been an enlisted man and, and, and got a commission, uh, called them Mustangs, I think, uh, and so Lieutenant Fox was there. I've forgotten the battery commander's name, but he was a Naval Academy guy. And uh, so after, after this, this mortar attack from uh, either the Viet, Viet Cong or, or NVA, uh, the battery commander was, was killed and the uh, fire direction officer was unconscious. He was still alive, but he was unconscious and mortally wounded. So uh, after sort of gathering ourselves and, and preparing for an onslaught, uh, they tried to attack our perimeter and our lines and so forth, and we repelled that. And uh, uh, did not get, could, and so it's dark by then and we're still taking fire, so we didn't get a medevac in until the next day. Uh, but we kept the fire direction officer alive, was, had a corpsman there. Uh, but it was just such uh, an experience to be 
brand new in country, second lieutenant, and I was sort of in charge of this element of our battery, you know, for a day or so yeah. until they could respond. And uh, I think, and I remember being on the radio, and we we didn't have real good radio contact, uh, but I remember. Um, the artillery, uh, I guess the 2nd Battalion headquarters, whoever that commander was there, probably Lieutenant Colonel, he, he got on the phone and, and uh, he was trying to get an update on the situation and, and uh, who was wounded and who was KIA. And so I was on the, on the radio trying to use proper uh, protocol, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, but the but the transmissions were not very good. He couldn't hear, and I could hardly hear him. <clears throat> so he was he was uh, very uh, 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 very upset that he couldn't he couldn't hear you know what what was going on. And so you know I, I was just screaming you know on this on this mic you know and trying to tell him, and he and he finally understood that the. I'm trying to remember those uh, those terms we used, but uh, the battery had a had a radio name, you know, like Arnica Delta, I think, was the name of our of our battery, and the and the battery commander was like Arnica Delta Six, and I've forgotten the number for the fire direction officer, but he was maybe number four or something like that. So Arnica Delta Arnica Delta Six is KIA, and and Arnica Delta Four is WIA, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so they were just almost, almost didn't believe it, you know, just almost didn't believe it. And uh, he said, well, who is this? You know, asking me who I am on the radio, you know. And your protocol suggested that you didn't give your proper name, you know. And so I didn't, you know, I was so low on the totem pole, I didn't have a, I didn't have a number, you know. And, and so uh, I think I finally just told him who I was, you know. I said, well, what the heck? So, Anyway, that whole experience, for some reason, stuck in my mind all these years. And that's when you first got over there. Yeah, I was just there. But but shortly after that, we collected the battery and got a new uh, commanding officer in a day or two. And I was assigned out as a forward observer. And so, uh, for quite a while, in these in in this launching of this this really tough operation, Operation Union One and then later Operation Union Two, and then there were just a succession all summer of other operations against the second NVA division and a lot of elements of Viet Cong in there too. Uh, I got my indoctrination. Talk a little bit about being a forward observer because I know it has a reputation of being one of the riskier assignments you could have in a situation well, like Vietnam. Yes, there's no doubt about that. But but frankly, in my opinion, no 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 riskier than a infantry platoon commander or a rifleman. But uh, uh, I would I would have uh, a radio operator. The radios in those days were uh, pretty large. You know, you wore them on your on your back, and there was a pretty long antenna, and that was a sort of a target for anybody that wanted to shoot somebody. They they'd look for the who's who's the guy in front of the radio operator, and that'd usually be me. Um, unfortunately, um, I lost a number of radio operators, you know, either killed or wounded. Uh, while you were out on a While I was a forward observer, you know, just, um, and, and regrettably, I don't remember their names even, you know, I, I remember some faces, but uh, it's been so long, it's been almost 50 years, so I've forgotten names. But uh, <clears throat> it was important for a forward observer, excuse me, drink of water, it was important for a Ford observer to be able to observe. And uh, in most cases, you needed to see the, the target or the target area. And so when contact was made, uh, normally uh, I would move up <coughs> to get a vantage point uh, so that I knew where to call in the fire. Almost in every case, uh, our, encounter, uh, our encounters with Viet Cong or NVA were close encounters. 
Uh, that was their style. We normally patrolled into their, into their awaiting positions. And so uh, it was normally pretty close. And so uh, it was doubly important for me to, to locate where we were and locate where we wanted to, to fire the rounds. And so I needed to be as close as I could to, to the target to, to make sure it, it, was, it was done properly. Um, we couldn't always uh, uh, employ artillery fire. Uh, sometimes we were out of range. Our battery had 105 howitzers. Uh, we later were augmented because of the size of the Quezon Valley. They, they later brought in some 155 howitzers, which is a much longer range, and even brought in uh, some 8-inch howitzers. And then before we left the Quezon Valley, there was, there was an old piece that's no longer, I'm sure, in, in use called a 155 gun, which is a real long barrel, uh, long range weapon, because we were also supporting uh, Marine reconnaissance units up in the mountains who were monitoring the movement of the NVA up and down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So we were, we were firing up onto the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, when, they would, when they would have uh, uh, movement, but basically we were a 105 battery. So there were times that we that that I would be with an infantry unit that would get out of range and and we couldn't effectively get fire in. Or there might be times when there was uh, uh, medevacs going on, helicopter traffic in and out, and we had to had to wait for that. And uh, then other times when we might have an airstrike planned, and it and it always took time to call those in, and then and then get them on station and then get them in and then get them out. And of course, in the heat of, of an encounter or a battle, uh, waiting on all the clearances was a really uh, tedious and exasperating experience because you need the fire right now, but you might have to wait 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. And, and sometimes it was, it was too late you know, to get it when, when you could finally get clearance. That had to be frustrating. Uh, it was frustrating, yeah, but it was necessary. I mean, they didn't want to shoot down any aircraft. And they they knew more than we did, but we just knew that we had the need for uh, for fire support. And usually, the <coughs> platoon commanders and company infantry platoon commanders and company commanders were were hollering at me to get that artillery out here, you know. And I say, well, I've got it. I've got the request in, but they they've got me on hold right now, you know. So we had all those those types of experiences, but. Uh, I would go out uh, usually with with an infantry company. Lots of times it might just be a, a platoon, like if a company uh, was in a certain area and then the company commander decided to send a platoon out, uh, he might ask me, the Ford Observer, to go with that platoon to, to be there if necessary to call an artillery fire. So uh, I was pretty flexible, you know, I'd, I'd go with, if. I was asked to go and wherever I was asked to go. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of, for that first six months, I didn't spend a lot of time uh, back in my, in my artillery battery. Most of the time I was, I was with the infantry unit on the move in an operation, especially in this Quezon operation. It was, it was the most active uh, part of my whole tour, really. What was the result of that operation? Well, uh, it's interesting, and, and of course we didn't know this at the time, but I, but I learned later, we, we decimated the 2nd the NVA Division. I don't know what their full strength numbers were, but uh, over, over 6,000 uh, uh, NVA killed between April and, and November of 67. And the, and the result of that, not only was the decimation of, of their div, uh, division, uh, but it, it took away their their effectiveness to control the Quezon Valley, and it took away their ability to capture the city of Da Nang in the Tet Offensive of 1968. Of course, we didn't know that impact, you know, when we were there on the ground, but it, but it had a, it had a very strategic impact. Very and significant, significant impact. Really significant impact, and and many people uh, felt like it saved all the all the provinces north of the Quezon Valley in South Vietnam there I think there were about five provinces that that they were attempting going to cut off and, and reclaim 
as part of that overall TET uh, strategies. So uh, we we really reclaimed the valley, not totally. It was never never peaceful. It was always elements of Viet Cong there. There was always resistance. We we I can't I, I really can't remember many, if any, uh, occasions when we went out on on patrols, even if it was a day patrol or if it was a several day patrol, where we didn't take some type of fire. Uh, even if it was just harassing fire, but sometimes a, a, a pretty tough encounter. Um, but later, the, uh, the, the powers to be moved us uh, back out of the west end of the Quezon Valley and moved us over toward the sea, east of Highway 1, and one of the sizable towns there is Hoi An. I don't know if you know much about it, but I understand it's turned into a bit of a resort town now, a nice seacoast town. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, we were not in Hoi An, but we were near there. And, and I, my memory of that area is that that is also where uh, the Korean Marines had a contingent. And we did some joint operations with the Korean Marines. And, I, and we all gained uh, great respect for them. Uh, they were they were really well trained and really good fighters, and they were very dependable as compared to the Arvin, who were not so well trained and were not always so dependable to to stand and fight. Uh, you could count on the Korean Marines if they were on your left flank or right flank, and they had a they had a, a mission they would carry it out, and so we interacted with them to some degree and. And uh, I remember uh, uh, a, a group of us officers being invited over to the Korean Marine uh, Command area uh, for a meal, and of course it was Korean food, and uh, and, and they brought out uh, bottles of uh, Johnny Walker Scotch and <laughs> Jack Daniel Bourbon, and we said, "My gosh, where did they get all this stuff? Cold beer, you know?" And felt right at home. We thought, we thought, "My goodness, you know, these guys are much better than we are, and they're they're Koreans, and we can't get our own <laughs> brands of stuff here." But uh, uh, we had a, we had a good association with the, with the Korean Marines, uh, and to this day, I respect them and 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 like them. Speaking of the Arvin and the Vietnamese, did you have any? significant contact on a personal basis with any Vietnamese while you were there as far as just getting to know them or? Didn't have any personal relationships or, uh, of course we had lots and lots of uh, uh, just personal observations, I guess is the way to, to, to put it, on all these, all these villes, all these villages we call villes that we would pass through and and the farmers and the families uh, were just in huts, and and they were always, of course, just all eyes watching us, you know, as we would walk through, and we were always uh, uh, somewhat suspicious, uh, not knowing who might be Viet Cong and who might yeah. not be Viet Cong, and and so. Uh, uh, a lot of the guys, not not me really, but a lot of the guys would would buy drinks. You know, they were always peddling uh, Coca Colas, and and uh, they were somehow able to get ice. You know, and we we were amazed that they would have these little baskets that would actually have some ice and have Coca Colas, and and uh, uh, so uh, we we had that level of interaction, but. But we never really integrated any of the Arvin troops into into our unit for that type of operation. Uh, uh, now there was there were some Marines, and I'm, I'm trying to think of what they were called. But some of my Marine buddies from basic school were actually assigned out as advisors uh, to Arvin units, uh, and uh, they had their own experience there. You know. Well, you were. A participant in a number of operations. Uh, we're, I guess now we're in 1967. Right. Can, well, continue on. 67 and, and throughout the summer, we were in the Quezon Valley, and they would start an operation. It would last a few weeks, and then it would be over. 
um, and then and then a few days later they would name a new operation and we'd go back out and so there was just a succession of those operations. Some were really intense. Some were actually uh, uh, hand to hand, just just NVA inside our lines and and just lots of casualties and lots of of, of KIAs and and um, other operations were were just incidental contacts and and mortar exchanges and artillery exchanges and and observation of NVA troops uh, way across a rice paddy and calling in artillery and aircraft on them and and exchanging machine gun fire and uh, and we were taking taking hills and finding supplies and and bunkers where they had stored just lots and lots of of gear lots of medical supplies and it just amazed me how they could walk all that down from North Vietnam and uh, and and store it in there um, lots of ammo um, and we were always disappointed that 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 we didn't get much cooperation out of the local uh, population. They they didn't they didn't point out where any of this was. You know, the, we'd have to find it on our own. But uh, we we got fairly good at doing that. Uh, uh, we captured uh, quite a few uh, Viet Cong and and NVA and uh, usually got information out of them. You know, and. Uh, I'll tell you one little little quick anecdote. Uh, before I left the States uh, for Vietnam, I came back to Atlanta for a few days. And uh, a good friend of, of my father uh, had been a, in the Navy, and he was a, maybe, maybe in the Navy Reserve even at that, at that point. And so he ordered a knife. All the Marines carry what was called a K-bar, but just a, a, a knife on on their belt. And, and so he had ordered a, a knife from this company called Randall Made Knives. It's a custom knife company down in Florida that's well known for a lot of people. And so he said, "I want I want you to take this to Vietnam with you." So it was a, a fighting knife, you know, big long bladed knife like a K-bar. And so uh, I took it, you know, and I wore it. Uh, and it was in a leather sheath, and it and it looked a little different than the standard military knife. And uh, so, it's one particular uh, time we captured some MVA, and we they were all tied up, and they were sitting on the ground, and I was just there. I didn't speak the language and didn't know what they were saying, but there was somebody there who was interrogating them. And so, as I stood there, one of the NVA. Uh, looked at me and he noticed that knife and he, and he smiled and he said something in Vietnamese. And uh, so I asked the guy uh, who was interpreting there, you know, what did he say? He said, he recognizes that knife. I said, what do you mean? He said, his, his, uh, his commander, his, I don't, I don't remember the rank of his commander, but his commander has seen that in his binoculars and he's told us that if you can get me that knife, I'll pay you some money and so forth. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never have forgotten that story. Yeah. And uh, so I started putting my knife in my backpack at yeah, that point. You know. But just to think that they, you know, were watching and yeah. we had no idea, you know. Uh, anyway, Great. that was an interesting little anecdote. So, uh, um, yeah, that, that would make me a little nervous. <laughs> well, it was surprising more than anything, and and you've probably had other people say this, but there's absolutely with me, and I think with most everybody, there's a numbing effect. There's a numbing effect to battle. You know, it's 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 in a sense, it's unfortunate, uh, but probably necessary, emotionally necessary. But after just a short time, uh, you know, you you're not you're not in in that emotional shock. You know, when you see all the all the wounded people and limbs missing and all the bad things going on, 
uh, it, it, it's something that you can tolerate. Yeah. You know, you never accept it, but you can certainly uh, reach a point where you tolerate you it. Almost get uh, immune to any emotional impact. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and and really, I've learned later what you're doing is you're just tucking it all away. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going away. Right. It's just tucked away somewhere. But uh, um, lots and lots of stories and interesting things. Uh, I was a second lieutenant uh, until November of 1967, and then I uh, just it was time to be promoted, and so I was promoted to first lieutenant. And and uh, about that time, uh, I was brought back into the battery, and I was uh, first uh, the uh, assistant fire direction officer. Then I became the fire direction officer, and and and, and you stay in the fire direction center, and and you keep all the radios operating, and and you're in charge of all the 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 calculations of of uh, commands that need to go to the guns to respond to requests for fire and so uh, that's a real intense and important function and uh, I enjoyed that uh, as sort of an aptitude for math and and all that and we use cloud rules and all the things that you need to to get the commands out uh, we moved uh, so now we're in uh, November of 67, and the command structure started to think that there was another vulnerable area that we needed to respond to, and this was north of Da Nang. And when you leave Da Nang headed north on Highway 1, you go up through the High Van Pass, which is just a a, a twisting and turning route up through some steep mountains, really steep mountains and really hairpin turns and 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 when you get up through that uh, uh, you reach a point and I think the name of that little place or that little town is Fulak and that as it turns out is the narrowest part of South Vietnam and so Intelligence was suggesting that maybe they were going to try to cut off the country at that narrow point. And so 1st Battalion, and 5th Marines and our battery was sent up there to be, in effect, a blocking force and not let that happen. And uh, I guess I can be candid now that I'm long gone from the Marine Corps, but somebody, somebody in, a, in, a, in, a, in a command position chose the absolute worst location to, to place a battery <laughs> and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an infantry battalion uh, CP. Uh, they put us right in a bowl that was surrounded on three sides by these steep mountains. And we had not even, we had not even pulled into place before they started hammering us, you know. And we didn't stay, we only stayed there for less than a month. Because they were just just yeah. just killing us there, you know. I mean, all the tents. You'd, you'd look up through your tent, and it was just full of holes, just full of holes. And and the trucks that we used to tow our artillery pieces, they were all out of action. All the tires were flat, you know, and Boy. other damage. And and I was one of my one of my duties at that point was I was the they call the Motor T officer, in addition to being the executive officer of the battery at that point. And uh, so I was supposed to keep those trucks running, and, and every time we'd, we'd repair them, they'd, they'd be mortared again. So we had to get uh, support from a higher level of support, and they sent a bunch of equipment down and guys down, and we fixed them up, and then we we left, but that was a that was a tough location for uh, quite a while. And so then uh, we uh, so then I had R and R, and by that time it's December, and uh, I was lucky enough, and I didn't know if I'd get this or not, but uh, I actually got Christmas as part of my R and R, and I went to Hawaii, and uh, uh, it was a uh, a nice break, but uh, the the body shock of 
of, of yeah. getting to Hawaii and getting all these wonderful steaks and all this food. You know, my stomach was upset the whole time, and then I caught a cold, and it was yeah. sick most of the time, and I went yeah. back uh, to Vietnam feeling terrible, running a fever, and anyway. Feeling worse than you did. I think I did. I think I did. <laughs> but it was nice having a change of scenery. Um, and so uh, when I got back to Battery, that uh, it was only a short time before the Tet Offensive. And the Tet Offensive started right around the end of January. And uh, uh, as I recall it, and here I am really just a lieutenant in a battery, so, you know, I, don't, I didn't have the benefit of, of the, the overall scheme of what was going on. Uh, you know, we, we trying, to, trying to learn and understand it, but we we're in a battery and, and we just, it filters down and you take the orders you got and you act on it, you know, but, but I'm, I, I still don't think that initially uh, uh, we knew the, the impact or the magnitude of the Tet Offensive. I think it took a week or two for us to really understand that there was a major operation going on. Uh, uh, we didn't know that the NVA had gotten into way and totally occupied it. There was a, there was a small, sort of small, Arvin outpost there that had some Army advisors as part of it. Uh, but for some reason, they didn't they didn't know it or didn't believe it. And here again, you know, I was not in a position. And where were you when the Tet Offensive started? Well, physically? we had uh, we had moved up near Fubai, which is just south of Way, and so they had to relocate us again closer to Way so that we could try to get into artillery range to support. Um, by that time, they said we 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 have some Marine units that can go in. Uh, we think there's some activity there. Uh, we didn't know that it was as much as as it turned out to be. Uh, so we moved into a, a a new spot, and here it is, late January, early February. That's monsoon time. Uh, so it's it's raining like the Dickens. It's cloudy most of the time. Uh, nights are cold, you know, because they're wet you know, and cooler anyway. And so we didn't have the gear to really stay warm and everybody was wet and cold and, and we were trying to, to set up and, and um, it, was, it was really hectic. It was really, really hectic. Uh, we, needed, we needed some longer range pieces and we eventually got uh, a couple of uh, Eight inch howitzers in that, that allowed us then to uh, fire rounds uh, anywhere in the city of Way that uh, that it was called for, and I'm a I'm a big fan of an eight inch howitzer. It's it's a it's a I don't even think they have those anymore, but they were really really accurate. I mean the rate of fire is slower because the rounds are so big, uh, but but they are very very accurate, and so we were literally able to. Uh, respond to calls for fire and, and, and walk rounds, you know, down a street and when you get to this point, you know, turn right and walk it down this way. And so uh, there, was, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, saving the buildings of the city. Oh, okay. And so even though we knew or the, or, or the ground troops knew where the NVA were were holed up and, and occupying, we couldn't just indiscriminately just blast those buildings. There were restrictions on that. That's interesting because a lot of military units or countries wouldn't worry about destroying No, them. but there, there were That's some good. politics involved with, yeah. this, with the Vietnamese and whoever. Yeah. And uh, this was that old ancient city that, yeah. you know, had so much there. And, yeah. and uh, so, uh, Quite honestly, we we were sacrificing uh, lives yeah. to some degree because of that. But but anyway, there. But with the eight-inch howitzer, we could comply with with yeah. with those restrictions and still provide supporting fire. Uh, our lines were attacked. Uh, uh, it was uh, it was it was just truly a hectic time. And I remember that 
that the 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 killed in action guys, the guys that were killed, uh, were taken down to Fubai because you you could fly fixed wing aircraft out of Fubai, and so uh, a number of times uh, I had to go down to Fubai because uh, they'd have uh, you'd have to identify some bodies before they they flew them out just yeah. to double check and make sure you got the right dog tags on the right guys, you know. And I'll never forget that experience. It was. Uh, even after having been in Vietnam that long, it was still yeah. uh, a really tough uh, experience to have sure to do, you know. Um, but um, after after Hue, uh, we we really uh, once again decimated that NVA unit. You know, they a lot of them escaped. Um, but most of them did not, and so I felt like we had a very successful operation there. Did you have the opportunity to go into way after the battle was over and see the after effects? Yes. Can yes. you describe that? Uh, a lot of destruction there, a lot, you know, uh, uh, almost, almost every building had some degree of destruction. Uh, a, a lot of buildings were partially standing and still had some of the old architecture and so forth, but uh, a lot of desperation, uh, civilians, and and I don't know if, it, I, I guess it's been brought out, but for a long time I didn't think that it was really widely known. The, the vast number of Vietnamese civilians that the NVA just assassinated just assassinated. And I was just, at the time, just could not understand why they would assassinate their their fellow Vietnamese people like that, even if they were North and South. You know, still so many families were interrelated. Um, and so, if anything, that reassured me that we were there for, for the right purpose. We were there for a noble purpose. These were vicious people who had somehow been indoctrinated with this this feeling that communism at all costs is is what uh, is what they should should carry out. It was really not uh, this this wonderful reuni re reuniting of our old, old ancient country. This was an imposition of a, of a, of a terrible terrible. Uh, uh, way of life, and w I just saw it firsthand in these piles of civilian bodies, children and women, uh, just w shot in the head. You know, I just I'll never forget seeing that. And of course, many of them uh, were buried in these mass graves, and I was not at the site where they uh, discovered and, and, and uncovered all that. But uh, you know, they were just all over town. So that's a wonderful observation. I, I sort of wish. Every American could hear you say that. Uh, I I have never I have never had second thoughts about the the noble cause that that that, that we participated in. I've never had that. Good. I think there's been a tremendous amount of misunderstanding and mischaracterization, and certainly uh, I uh, I'm deeply and forever disappointed in and a lot of the politics of that time. Uh, but but I was not a politician. I was a United States Marine. And I was called upon to to uh, serve my country and, and defend freedom and democracy. And, and, I've, and, and quite honestly, our unit was, I mean, the people I served with felt that way. Uh, uh, we were not a ragtag bunch of disgruntled guys who reluctantly went to Vietnam. We were there because we had a purpose. We were well trained, and of course, a dimension of fighting is 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 defending your buddies and and fighting for your buddies, and it becomes a very personal experience. But still, that overreaching goal of of stopping the spread of communism, and and I think you know if if you if you go back to that time, the the, the mid to late '60s. Uh, Communism was spreading, you know, and 
and in, in Europe it was spreading, and and uh, China was a real threat in the world, and and we were seeing that, or you know, we we all believed and were taught that 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 if America didn't defend democracy and personal rights and freedom, that the world could be lost to communism. And so this was, this was something that we didn't want to see happen. And uh, you know, that's why I was in Vietnam. You know, it was my time to serve and I was called upon to serve. And I think I, I was not alone in feeling that way. Uh, all the Marines I served with felt that way. We, we felt like we were there for the right, right reason. Now, I will have to say that during the course of my 13 months, I became, and a lot of my, my fellow Marines became very, very frustrated at the, uh, this limited warfare yeah. that, that we were asked to participate in. You know, here we have all, these, all the capabilities to move in properly and win this battle, but we were sent in with this measured amount of weaponry and support and numbers of troops, and uh, it cost a tremendous number of lives, and 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 ultimately uh, uh, cost us the type of results that we went over there to to try to achieve. And don't you think, as time goes on, more people are recognizing that? Well, I hope so. Do I hope so. Are writing about that. I hope so. Although. You know, I've just watched the nine or ten series yeah. of the Ken Burns, and the Ken Burns thing, while it's well, well put together, uh, I, I, I think it misses that point, yeah. and I and I regret that, because uh, perhaps that's going to become uh, accepted as sort of the history of the event, yeah. and and it, and it's not correct. It's not correct, and I would have to say that the people who were chosen to be interviewed throughout the film uh, segments uh, are, are not, the, not the people that I know and not me and I don't think represent the majority of those of us who served. And so to that degree, that's not an objective film. I just have to say that. I agree so, with you 100%. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, after Way, uh, I know you were still After Way, we, we uh, I'd have to look up the name of the operation, but we, we had Another operation that was more protracted, uh, it was in that area uh, west of Wei and west of Fubai, north of Da Nang, and, and there was still a lot of, uh, a lot of Viet Cong, a lot of uh, uh, small unit NVA activity going on. But once again, we had, we had really uh, uh, kicked the butts of, of the NVA division that went into way. And so it was fragmented. It was fragmented after that. And we didn't have, during the remainder of my tour, which was then uh, on, well, that was the month, Febu February was Tet. And so March and, and most of April, for the, say six, six or seven weeks, w we just had small unit encounters uh, before I departed. So I gather, in your opinion, and a lot of people have written about this now, that the situation was much better after the Tet Offensive from the Americans and the South Vietnamese standpoint as far as security and the way the NVA had been weakened to a certain extent. That was my experience of the area that we were in. Uh, they were weakened substantially. Uh, perhaps they were uh, demoralized to some degree, they should have been, uh, and uh, we certainly didn't feel the the threat of invasions and, and large scale operations that we'd experienced in the Quezon Valley, and then and then then later in Way. Uh, uh, we were uh, they were still there. Uh, they were still. Real, real active uh, battles up up near the DMZ. That was Third Marine Division. I was First Marine Division. So uh, we didn't. You know, the only reports we got were just on the on the radio station. What was that Armed Forces radio yeah, thing that we yeah. could that we could tune into sometime? 
Uh, well, and I'm sure you were like most individuals who served in Vietnam or any other war or conflict. You were concerned about your area, what you were doing, and what was very much, very, very much, very much focused on, on, on my job, my responsibility, especially when I, especially when I was a forward observer, yeah. because I was the one guy in that infantry company, or in some cases, uh, larger than an infantry company, who who was the the link to bring in artillery supporting fire at the times we needed. So I, I felt a real heavy sense of responsibility. Uh, I don't know if I said earlier, but, but my, my secondary duty as a forward observer um, was to be the navigator of the unit that I was with. Uh, because as you might imagine, the company, infantry company commander has got a thousand things going on. He's trying to assess where the enemy might be uh, where his units are, where they need to move, can they get through here, can they get through there, what's going on behind him, you know, just lots and lots of things going on. And so the last thing he needs to do is to spend his time with a map saying, okay, now where are we now, you know. Yeah. And so they would typically count on me to say, you know, you keep up with where we are so that we know at all times where we are. And so I was very much into the map and into where we are on the ground mm -hmm. And so that, you know, number one, if I need to call artillery fire, I can tell them where I am. But also for the, for the infantry leaders, um, I could tell them where we are, yeah. you know. Uh, if we're calling for medevacs or whatever, for whatever reason, you know, we always need to try to know where we are. And the maps were sometimes out of date. Uh, we didn't have defining landmarks, uh, uh, didn't have prominent features out in the middle of the Quezon Valley, for instance, it's a very wide valley, uh, spotty little little huts and hooches, but not big villages really. And so uh, uh, that first artillery round that you call in is always, <laughs> you know, I hope it's right, I hope I'm right, you know. And many times we'd call in a white phosphorus round uh, uh, and, and we would purposefully call it in at some distance just to try to confirm that, that everything's where we think it is and then we could adjust it in from there. Well, and I assume based on what you said earlier, I mean, you, you almost in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the NVA and that pretty much Very, 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 very close. And, and there, I've forgotten all the terminology now that we used on the radio, but one of the, one of the terms that I do recall is is when a fire mission or when, when you're calling for fire support and it's really close to, to our position, uh, you would say danger close. And almost every time it was danger close. And I've forgotten what that range was, but within so many meters, yeah. uh, it would be danger close. And most of the time, uh, it was a danger close mission. And, and uh, uh, of course you had, uh, and here again, I, I'm rusty on terminology, but you had the type of artillery round that would that would uh, detonate when it hit the ground, and then you have artillery rounds that would detonate in the air. Uh, and if if the if the enemy were in bunkers or dug in, you might get air burst, you know. And so you had to be especially careful with those when they were close, because you could easily get rounds uh, into your own uh, lines. Uh, Almost when I was in the battery, you know, almost every night, but certainly most nights, uh, they'd have uh, harassment and interdiction fire. We call it H and I fire, and so all night long, you know, uh, one or two guns would have the duty for a few hours, and then those guys get to go to sleep and wake up the other guys, and they have a they have a time slot, and so most all night, you know, you'd be firing. Uh, at trail intersections where we suspect enemy movement at night and and things like that and uh, uh, so it was sort of a never-ending thing uh, I wear 
two hearing aids today because because of all of that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> lots of uh, lots of fire uh, well, going out and coming in. <laughs> when did you leave Vietnam? So I I. I departed in May, and I don't know the exact uh, date, but in, in uh, early May, early to mid-May of 1968. Okay. So between Way and uh, the time you left, there were you know, a few months, and you say that was not quite as active as the activity was before you left? No, and that, and that operation was Harvest something. I don't know what, what what was on the notes there? The last operation. Actually, Baxter Garden. Yeah. Operation Houston uh, lasted from the end of February through <coughs> the end of April. So Houston was the long one. Okay. And then it was a little bit of Baxter Garden, and I and I don't remember the difference in those two in terms of what we actually did. But most of these operations, uh, f for guys at my rank and, and my responsibility, those operations were just stop one and start another. But it was the same type activity. Yeah. Now, when you left Vietnam, did you leave as a unit or as an individual? As an individual. Okay. And. Uh, uh, Mixed feelings, Let, left, some, left some really close friends, left some really close friends. But I was, I was uh, more than ready to, yeah. to end my, my tour. I was ready. I mean, you had been through so much with these, your comrades, it had to be an emotional It was very emotional, situation. very emotional. But in those days, uh, we didn't have unit replacements, and so the whole year was was new guys coming, old guys leaving, new guys coming. And so there was quite a bit of turnover. And of course, some guys killed and wounded. But um, uh, uh, there were a few uh, from my basic school class uh, who ended up right there where I was for the time I was there. And they were, they were real good friends and real good buddies. Over the years, have you kept up with any of your not Not much. Not much. I know. I know a lot of guys have had reunions with their units and <clears throat> with their basic school class from Quantico, and uh, for no particular reason, we just haven't 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 had that and haven't done that. Uh, I'll have to say that uh, uh, when I finally left the Marine Corps, of course, still two years left when I leave. Vietnam, but anyway, two years after that, yeah. 1970, when I left the Marine Corps, I uh, sort of tucked all the experience away and uh, went on to my, my civilian career, my civilian life, and carry the emotions. But yeah. but really, uh, my way of, my way of dealing with that phase of my life was to. Uh, uh, not deny it, but just just tuck it away, yeah. you know. Of course, I did have the nice benefit of coming home from Vietnam. I still had two years of service. Yeah. Um, I was still in a military environment. In this case, I was at the uh, uh, naval base at Norfolk, at Marine Barracks uh, in Norfolk. And so that's a military town full of military people. Uh, uh, I know so many people uh, came back and uh, were exposed to criticism and harassment from different groups, but uh, I never experienced that because I, I was in Norfolk, and Norfolk was not a, not a place where I, I remember seeing any of that, really. And you see it on the, on the nightly national news, but, but not personally. How about when you first got into San Francisco or Oakland, did you have any issue? Well, as I recall, I landed maybe in Los Angeles if, if flights were coming in there. I, I seem to recall that I landed in Los Angeles at the at the main airport there, and I was in uniform, and had been flying a long time to, to land there. 
And uh, I remember getting my getting my sea bag and uh, going into the men's room and mostly undressing and at the lavatory, you know, bathing and shaving and, you know, trying to freshen up some and put on uh, a fresh yeah. uniform top and so forth. And nobody in that airport said anything bad or I don't remember anybody saying welcome home even. I didn't expect it, but, yeah. Yeah. you know, I, I didn't feel any, right. any, I didn't feel uncomfortable at all. Uh, we used to sit around in Vietnam uh, and had a great gunnery sergeant. Most of us have good senior non-commissioned officers. And uh, the gunnery sergeant would, would say, okay, guys, he'd say, uh, when you get back to the States, what's the first thing you want to eat? You know, we'd all dream about that. Oh, I want a hamburger. I want this or that, you know. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why, I wanted a fresh bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich <laughs> and a cold glass of milk. Yeah, that was really my dream if I could just get that crispy lettuce and freshly fried bacon. And uh, uh, in the Los Angeles airport, I didn't quite find it, but it wasn't long after I got home that I found one. You know, so uh, it, was, it was good. And flew on home and, and then... Uh, uh, was I was very pleased uh, when I got my orders to Marine Barracks, Norfolk. Uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, all the field units, whether they're in the United States or wherever they are, you know, it's called the Fleet Marine Force if you're in an art artillery regiment or infantry regiment. And then there are all sorts of garrison assignments. And in my case, I sort of got a garrison assignment. I went to the Marine Barracks. And had two years there, my last two years. And so the first of those two years, I was assigned about 30 miles away from the Marine Barracks, way down Virginia, at the south end of Virginia Beach, right on the Atlantic shore there, was a little Navy installation called Dam Neck, small operation there. And at Dam Neck, there was a rifle and pistol range and a marksmanship training operation there. And so when I arrived, I was assigned as the officer in charge of the marksmanship training unit in Damnick, 30 miles away. So it was like throwing me in the briar patch. Yeah. I was so thrilled to get there because I've, I've always um, enjoyed shooting and rifles and pistols and I was got the expert badge and I was yeah. proud of that, you know. And so uh, for a whole year I had a detachment of about 30 or 40 Marines and we would uh, qualify all the Marines in, in that Norfolk area, which were quite a few. A lot of the Coast Guardsmen had to be qualified uh, to carry weapons. And then quite a few of the Navy guys, if they were in a certain job, had to yeah. carry weapons too. So <clears throat> anybody required to carry a weapon had to come out occasionally and, okay. and requalify. So we had a constant procession of people coming out uh, for training. And then we also, uh, uh, this was sort of my initiative, uh, got the Virginia Beach uh, Police Department out and, and gave them opportunities and training and so forth too. But um, uh, it was a great experience because I was semi-autonomous out there, independent, yeah, yeah. and uh, really, really enjoyed it. Um, then I got promoted to uh, captain, and uh, that position could not be filled by a captain, so uh, I became the... Uh, security officer for the naval base and uh, part of that security responsibility were the uh, nuclear weapons that they have there in Norfolk and so it was a pretty pretty major responsibility to, to keep that area secure and all that sort of stuff and then we had the perimeter security of the base in those days I think all that's changed now uh, but all the gate security and the marine they had marine they used to have marines on all those gates yeah. and so Anyway, I did that. And then a lot of uh, 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 formations and parades and dress uniform and carry my officer's sword. And, and I, was, I was very much into all that stuff, yeah. too. So uh, I was a company commander uh, there at the Marine Barracks. And uh, we'd have evening parades on Friday evening. And a lot of people would come and watch those. And that, 
It was, it was good. Well, I'd say you've earned that with what you did in Vietnam. Well, I, I enjoyed it. And so in, in, a, in a way, it sort of harkened back to my ROTC days at Georgia Tech. And then even earlier when I was a yeah. kid, you know, we had a lot of parades. Yeah. And, and I didn't mention earlier, when I was at Georgia Military Academy, just as a youngster, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, um, Fort McPherson was still a very active Army base. And so uh, some of the people at Georgia Military Academy had connections at Fort McPherson. And we used to go over there and interact. And uh, they'd have parades of their Army guys. And sometimes they, we would uh, have a company of our guys, you know, on the parade field. And we just huh. felt so important, yeah. you know, and marching review and all <laughs> that so. sort of stuff. So uh, uh, I, I had a little bit of a background in all that. I enjoyed it very much. Well, did you ever give thought to making it a career? I did, very seriously, because I had a regular commission. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, expected or assumed that I would that I would continue my career. And uh, the Marine Corps was an was a enriching experience and a rewarding experience for me. And, and in most regards, very enjoyable. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I liked... Uh, uh, the responsibilities, you know, I, I think there's, you can't go anywhere uh, as, as a young college graduate and have the level of responsibility that you have as, as a commission officer. Uh, so uh, uh, the rub was, was two things. Uh, one, um, I was a captain, and it was time now, 1970, to rotate back to Vietnam. The war was really going south at that point. Uh, 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 morale was dropping with the troops. Uh, the writing was on the wall. You know, we knew we were going to get out. We just didn't know quite when and quite how. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to, to do that. But the second reason was, you know, I stayed in touch with so many of my Georgia Tech friends and classmates. and. One by one, they were going to graduate school and getting their advanced degrees, and and they were starting their careers. And, uh, you know, just quite honestly, I felt like, you know, I was I was not staying up with my buddies. Yeah. You know, they were getting their master's degrees and going on, and, and, I, and here I was at wow. that point, you know. So I um, finally decided I, th I think I'll, I think I'll uh, go to graduate school. And I think I'll I'll give it up. So, it was a tough decision, though. I, I thought months and months about that. Uh, uh, and actually, intended to to stay in the active reserve. Uh, but when I decided that Atlanta was the place I was coming back to, uh, and and surveyed where there might be an opening for a captain. Uh, there, were, there was no opening in Atlanta, and the only opening at, uh, that I could do was in Mobile, Alabama, in a, in a reconnaissance unit. And I just didn't want to go to Mobile right. once a month and, yeah. and uh, connect at that point. Well, this is a good transition to your post-military career. Talk, talk a little bit about your life after the military and your family. Well, uh, came back to Atlanta, uh, interviewed a number of companies uh, did did not automatically decide to go to work in my father's construction company. In fact, that was sort of down toward the bottom of the list. Uh, he had a small company. It was it was uh, basically just him and a and a handful of employees. Uh, you know, here I was a, a Georgia Tech grad and four years in the Marine Corps and a captain and you know a big head. Big ego, uh, and felt like I could do more than that. So uh, I, I interviewed some big companies and big banks, and I got some job offers. And uh, my dad was starting to have some health issues, and uh, so he said, why don't you think about this? Uh, come back and, and work in the company uh, while you're going to uh, Georgia State at night to get your master's degree. And see if see if you think it'll work. See if see if you like it, you know. And and if you do, it'd be great. And if you don't, that's fine, you know. So I sort of made made that commitment to myself and to him. I said, okay, I'll do that. So I did, and um, 
you know, here I am much, 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 much more mature uh, with a different outlook on life, yeah. you know. And quite honestly, I, I did feel like there was a, a, a good challenge there. He, he had a good reputation, uh, had, had good clients, and um, uh, I felt like I could, I could build on that and, and also uh, 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 give him some support that I felt like he needed uh, also. So I, I, I got my MBA, uh, sort of became kind of a project manager at our little company. And uh, I can remember going to, to the, because my degree was in industrial management. I did not get a civil engineering degree uh, at Georgia Tech. And so I can remember going to the Georgia Tech library uh, at night and checking out books, uh, civil engineering and building construction and project management and all the things I needed to know to be a contractor. And uh, uh, so there was an element there of being self-taught, but also OJ OJT at the company. Yeah. Uh, but but I think the thing that that really transferred from my Marine Corps experience that I really liked in this construction business was was team building and teamwork and. Of course, that's what the military is all about, you know, is, is the team effort and, and everybody does their part and as, and as a unit or as a whole, you know, we can do great things. And so that was every bit the case in construction because, because every job is, is pulling together subcontractors and, and workers and, 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 and getting the cooperation from the architect and the engineers. and. And, and then the next job, it's a different group of folks. And so you're team building, you know, each and every time slightly differently. And so that enjoyment of, of motivating and, 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 and uh, learning to uh, uh, get people to, to work together in a real positive way without barking out commands and orders uh, was a really enjoyable experience, and, and very so very similar to the military. Very similar, and it has been throughout my career, uh, and and so that's that's been one of the really really terrific lessons that I that I learned in the Marine Corps, uh, the Spree de Corps, you know, and it and it and I sort of have a Spree de Gay Construction Company now, you know. It's just uh, we have a culture there that that uh, respects one another, whether a person is an hourly worker uh, and a laborer, or whether he's a carpenter or a superintendent or a manager, uh, we respect and, and appreciate the effort of everybody in the company. That's and called, that, and that's stem, called leadership. Yeah, and that stem, stems from those Marine yeah. days, you know. So uh, I saw that opportunity and have, and have, and have, and have loved the satisfaction of, of growing the company, you know, with that type of philosophy. And it, I believe it's been 47 years now, is that right? It's been 47 years. It hardly seems like it, but it's got to be proud of that. Uh, it, 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 it's been a great career. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's it's sort of like, it, in this regard, like the Marine Corps too, it is really challenging. <laughs> yeah, sure. There is nothing easy <laughs> about the construction business, day in and day out. And there's nothing easy about the Marine Corps. Well, uh, based on what I've heard today, you're, you're up to the challenge. Well, uh, it's been fun, and I've enjoyed it, and I've been blessed, really, with great people who work for me. And, and uh, it's a really a team thing. Is there uh, anything you'd like to say about your family? Or? Well, uh, uh, I have two daughters. Uh, my daughter Jenny is is uh, uh, 38, and my daughter Laurie is 37, and have one granddaughter, uh, Amelie, who's soon to be three you know, in a week or two. And uh, really, really proud of all of them. Uh, uh, I'm married to Sandy Bryan, and uh, uh, we're very, very happy and. Uh, live close to Gay Construction Company, and uh, I've had a had a great experience living in Atlanta. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I love Atlanta. I love uh, so many good things going on here. I, I did have the nice benefit of 
being a Georgia Tech alum, and it's right here in Atlanta. And so in, in a number of ways, I've stayed connected and, and maintained and created new friendships. And, and, but one of the things that I've really enjoyed, and I think quite honestly, and I guess this is the time for me to say this, is that, that out of the gratitude of coming home from, from a really tough time in Vietnam for 13 months with my body intact, healthy, relatively healthy, uh, I came home with the, with, with the conviction that I would appreciate each and every day on this earth, and I have. And, and I love giving back in ways that, that, that present themselves. I've, I've just been pretty active in the community with a number of organizations and, and have had leadership roles in some community things. And um, just out of that sense of I was blessed to come home, you know, and, and, I, and I still appreciate that. And, uh, and Atlanta's been a great place for me to, to, to pour back out that gratitude that I've had. It's, it's been fun. Well, that's a wonderful philosophy, and I know you've benefited a lot of people by your actions, I'm sure. Boy Old Scouts videos. has been a big, a big part of my life. I was not a Boy Scout. I was at GMA wearing the GMA uniform in my Boy <laughs> Scout age years. But, uh, but uh, I, I really caught on to the, to the value and the, and the positive uh, influence that Boy Scouts can have on young people. And so that's been a big, a big thing, but a number of other organizations as well. Sue, do you have any questions? I don't think so. I think I'm good. This has been great. Well, I've probably gone on too long. No, you haven't. I, no, you haven't. I want to give you just one other opportunity if you want to say anything in, in closing or in summary. You, now's the time to do it. Oh, I haven't thought about any, any sort of closing comment, really. Uh, uh, I, I uh, just have had mixed feelings about sort of reopening these old memories and trying to re resurrect uh, some of these old experiences. Uh, but I think I think there's uh, I think there's value to me personally to do that. Uh, I don't know that I contribute anything to the to the greater knowledge of history, but but uh, but it it has been uh, worthwhile. I uh, I think all of us who serve in these uh, combat environments come home with some degree of post-traumatic stress. We didn't know that word when I came home, uh, but I've learned more about it in recent years, and unfortunately some people uh, suffer severely from it. Uh, I suppressed mine, I think, uh, but I think we, we live with it, and, and the people at Emory who run that program have, have told me that you know, you, we, we, can't, we can't cure you. That's not a word we use. And, and, and you'll never forget those experiences, but you can learn to, to understand them and deal with them. And, and, I, and I think I'm, I'm sort of at that point without having received professional therapy, and I probably should have. Uh, um, I, I understand it better and I sympathize with it more uh, and, and believe that uh, that as a society we, we, we need to reach out and help, and not only, not only military people, but uh, there are all sorts of civilian circumstances that cause traumatic stress, you know, car accidents and house fires and all those sorts of things, you know. But anyway, I, this, this experience of, of finally uh, agreeing to, to come in, Sue, and, I, and, I, and I'm sorry it took me, I'm sorry I was so reluctant. Uh, uh, but this experience of thinking about it once again, and now and now coming in and, and discussing it and talking about it, uh, is 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 a refreshing thing for me. And I thank well, and I, I thank you, you for the invitation. It benefits you possibly, but I think people that's going to really benefit are people that have the opportunity to listen to your story, your daughters, your granddaughter, anybody else, because. Number one, you've got such a great message about life in general, but also about your experiences and about our and about our country. And I think 
other people hearing that from you is going to benefit those people. And I really want to thank you for coming in here. I mean, you, you're very modest, but you've lived a heck of a life and are still living a heck yeah, of a life. It's been an interesting life. I mean, you you went into the military as a patriot, but also as a legacy to your I sort father. of I sort of stumbled into it in the halls of Northside High School. Well, that's and, uh, <laughs> and there, here yeah, I am. <laughs> amazing how that happened. Yeah, I know it. I know it. But you're, I mean, you were in some tough situations in Vietnam, obviously, and you, yeah. I think you played it down a little bit, but uh, it, it's obvious that you had your life on the line almost every day, particularly yeah. when you were with the, the it was an intense. It was an intense time. I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate. Uh, I just, I, I read, and I think it's worth stating that that um, that 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 Quason operation from April of 67 through November of 67, there were, uh, I, I, I gave the number of casualties, but there were five Marines and one Navy chaplain who earned uh, the Medal of Honor in that time, all posthumously. There were 27 Navy crosses, that's the second highest award you can get in the Navy or Marine Corps. There were 84 silver stars in that time. So that is some indication to me yeah. of, of, of the level of activity and bravery and valor that was exhibited there. So I'm very proud to have been a very small part of it, but well, part of the team. Be. And you should be proud again of, of telling your story because a lot of people will hear this that had no idea yeah. the sacrifice that these men made. Well, hopefully we won't forget. Thank you for having me in. Well, thank you, thank you and, and thank you for your service. Thank You're you. welcome.